So pay no attention to the title, it's really, um, it was a placeholder. There are going to be some things that you agree with and I'm sure some things that you vigorously disagree with and that's mostly the point. Um, my background, and just as a, as a brief backgrounder, I had started a company at the intersection of content and commerce called Bureau of Trade. Two years ago, eBay bought that company and I was made the first chief curator and then recently graduated to this title of global chief curator. But really, you know, we're in the midst of a paradigmatic shift in and across eBay and I think that's emblematic of what's happening in and across commerce more broadly. Uh, it, the landscape is virtually unrecognizable today relative to where we were five years ago. You know, gone, is, our CEO is fond of saying this, I'm certainly frequently, I've been accused of saying as much, the E is gone, it's about commerce, it's multidimensional, it's digital, it's physical, mobile, global, and with the notable exception of Germany, it's increasingly emotional. People are driven by things that really beat deep within their hearts. It's not just an analytical calculus, you're not just drawn to things that are flashy and interesting. Uh, the expectations are rising and growing ever higher. I think that these are also shifts that you'll recognize from web to mobile, from search to discovery, from products to people, and from curation to co-creation. And I really do want to focus on that notion of people. I mean, in an era of infinite choice, when I was at grad school, I studied um, international political economy. The point was that, um, what point was I making here? The products versus people? Right. That in, in economics is the study of this, is the science of the decisions that human beings make in the midst of scarcity. But in the midst of plenty, of unprecedented, uh, pl of, of plentitude, of being able to choose from, among, and between everything on planet Earth, and the decisions that you make about what to buy, when, and why, telegraph a message about who you are or the person that you someday aspire to be. It's, it's, it's almost as if at the point of purchase you're exercising democratic intent. And frankly, that those decisions are more representative about who you are and how you typically behave at the ballot box because your decisions are narrower. And so when you're thinking about a site like eBay where we have 800 million listings, um, the things that you buy everywhere else in planet, uh, everywhere else, forgive me, in life uh, are hugely important. And I think it becomes more interesting when we do it on the basis of who we know rather than what that thing seems to mean to us. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is, you know, at least for those of you that wanted to take notes or have something meaningful or substantive to walk away with, these really are the hard and fast rules of success in commerce. You could even throw in a seventh, which is SEO, that, but typically if you do at least three of these things, you can position yourself for success. To do all six is a guarantor of escape velocity growth, and it does come down to site design. You need a catalytic, sexy, seductive site that coaxes people to come back again and again. The second that sent mail is hugely important. If you were to calculate all site traffic from Pinterest, from all of the social from all of the social networks, and forgive me, I know I'm stumbling. It's because it's very hard to operate under said circumstances. Uh, sent mail still outperforms all social traffic by five times. Uh, it's the most powerful conversion channel at your disposal. Third, social, it is where people live. And remember, I wouldn't even call these social channels, I call them publishing platforms, each with their own um, social mores, their own language, their own traditions, their own um, behaviors. And we have to behave as natives and not just you know treat them as promotional opportunities. Shipping services and speed are the three things that eBay uh, lamentably can't yet do, but that holy troika is where we try and focus our energy. Um, one other thing I would want to point out is that you know, when eBay started 20 years ago, uh, even, te even 10 years into its tenure, the year 2004, there were only 8 million websites on planet Earth. That's it. Today there's a billion websites. It's just 10 years later. And there's still 1.5 million apps on uh, Android, only 1.4 on iOS. That's the nature of the competition that we face. It's, it's a competition for people's attention. It's not eBay versus Amazon. It's eBay versus anything else that you could be doing with your life. And that's true of a small startup. We're just competing for infinitesimal slivers of people's attention. And to make it matter, it has to, I think, abide by or uh, cohere to some of the ideas we talked about moments ago. I think it's also worth keeping in mind when you're, when we're, the, the nature of the debate today, if you're on an app or you're on a website, is that you're competing, when somebody lands on your site, and you can call it bounce, and you can call it churn, you can call it whatever you want, you have four seconds, approximately, to defend your life, to give somebody a compelling reason to stay. It's even harder to keep them to come back on a routine basis, unless you're making it comedic, or compelling, or controversial. 
but that's all you got. Bull riders have twice as much time as we do. That, I think, is sort of the challenge that most entrepreneurs face. How do you grab somebody by the proverbial shirt collar, drag them to the site, or whatever it is that you happen to be working on at the time, and force them to stay and give them a compelling reason to come back? That's enormously difficult, but that's what all of us who are trying to start companies or operate in larger organizations are trying to pull off every single day. Uh, the greater challenge still, and I think this is where uh, what we're eyeing in the next several years, is creating physical or digital encounters that leverage the power of hyper-selectivity, because I'm tired of using curation, as I'm sure everyone else here is, to reveal the unseen and make people feel something new or unfamiliar. That, to me, is like the nature of the beast. That's what all of us are trying to do across domains, across disciplines. It's no longer about pushing products. It's about cultivating personal experiences. I certainly won't be the first, nor will I be the last, to talk about the paramountcy of the experience. From discovery online to delivery on your doorstep, every single moment is a scripted journey, or at least it should be. Because people, in fact, that was what I was reminded of in the prior presentation, which I thought was really ennobling and hugely encouraging, is we've grown so accustomed to many things in life now working because designers have been affixing their attention to the world's most vexing problems for the last 25 years. Taking pain points, either things that drive us collectively nuts or things that were otherwise mundane into which we could inject more passion and intrigue. And they've been doing it. They've been profoundly re-engineering the world as we know it. But it means that, in, you know, again, these tiny little things are causing ever greater aggravation. And that's where I think there's still opportunities um, to create real impact. So the companies, the individuals, the entrepreneurs, the designers, anybody, the people that do this best, they create self-sustaining ecosystems. They're not just turnkey products. For those of you that are that know anything, you know that that work in or are drawn to commerce, there is this was this is some version of our ecosystem. That you have a sense of awareness, you're led through to the moment of discovery, consideration, comparison. You see it. I created those as permeable boundaries because there you can't get outside of that purchase funnel. But the real areas for profound disruption in the next couple of years are around this notion of conversation. How do we share ideas with each other? How do we communicate? How do we talk? How do we build these purposeful, identity-based or value-based communities around these experiences that reciprocally inform broader awareness that leads back through that tunnel? But with all those things in mind, I think I just want to like move on. Like that's the, that's the, the background, or that's your basics if you needed to take notes about commerce. I'm more interested, more broadly, in experience design. Uh, you know, the classic example that was used in that book is taking the coffee bean. If you harvest a kilo of coffee beans in Ecuador, that kilo is worth 25 cents. And if those coffee beans are roasted by an anonymous party, that same kilo is suddenly worth a dollar. And if those anonymously roasted coffee beans are sent stateside and brewed by a semi-anonymous, you know, corner store coffee shop, it's worth a dollar twenty-five a cup. And if it's roasted by a Starbucks, it's worth two fifty a cup. And suddenly, that one bean, if it was crushed and made into an espresso in Venice during Biennale, and you're seated around in that kind of a context, it's worth 15 euro in a little poor cup. That means as you move up this value chain around experience specifically, there's untold riches to be harvested. And that's what I really think, both as designers and as entrepreneurs, as members of companies, we have to think more seriously and critically in the years to come about delivering superlative experiences. Oh, and I threw in the Yeezy bag of air. Did anyone see that? It was an internet phenom. Somebody went to a Kanye concert, used a glad bag, like a garbage bag, captured the air. Not from him, just the air at the concert. And they taped it off, and they sold it on eBay. By a raise of hands, does, does anyone here know how much the final sale price was? It was seventy thousand dollars. Okay. Now you may not think it's worth it. I mean, that we can have a longer debate about it, but that's an experience that somebody was trying, clearly willing to part with seventy grand to pay for. Uh, this idea about Aesop rising. Uh, you, you, you probably are sick of people talking about storytelling. I'm certainly sick of people talking about storytelling, but there's evidence for it everywhere. And I don't just mean ASAP Rocky or ASAP, you know, the creams. Uh, there's, there's something that beats deep within the human heart that dates back to the time which we were all, you know, to our simian ancestors gathering around the campfire in a pre-verbal state, but we would grunt out a recollection of what occurred that day. That same driving motivation exists within all of us, and you're seeing more and more evidence for it everywhere on and offline. I don't think that this trend looks likely to wane anytime soon. I think the bigger question is, how do we integrate that same desire, that need, that yearning into all the things that we do? Um, mindful of time, let me just sprint past this one. 
this is something else that we all have to contend with. This notion of third party influencers, are they actually a vital, a vital element of this ecosystem or is it like a new version of La Cosa Nostra? Meaning, is it a new mafia? I don't know. I mean, when you turn on, when you pay for that proverbial spigot to drive traffic and to inform or enhance or uh, feed uh, as a source of water, that ecosystem, then you're making a conscious decision. Unfortunately, when you stop paying for it, therewith that tra traffic drops off precipitously. I simply mention it because uh, there... <laughs> One, it's a macro trend. Two, I don't know that we that there is any definitive consensus about where this is all headed next. But these are issues with which, as big companies, as small companies, as startups, we increasingly have to contend either to remain relevant, to reach people, or sometimes to just get that early escape velocity growth. Uh, I do believe that failure is overrated. I'm tired of talking about people embracing and celebrating and uh, heaping encomium on shortcomings. I think the point is about, as we saw in several last presentations, it's hugely important to iterate. I think if you look at the people on planet Earth, when you, look about, when you look at individual success, these are often men and women who are constitutionally incapable of computing failure. They couldn't tolerate it. They hated losing so much that they figured out a way to win. That's the principle here. It's how do you keep g getting at it or after it again and again and again and again until finally you succeed. We look at Vice Media at the moment. I mean, I, I'm probably one of the older people in the room. I remember when this was a magazine. I remember when this had a devil may care at it. It, it wasn't about the money. Now it's a $2.3 billion valuation company. Maybe if you go out to their facilities in Brooklyn, it certainly looks like that, but that's 20 years in the making. It's not about becoming a unicorn in three to four. That's where I think it's about just figuring it out again and again and again because you have an, in, an unslakeable thirst or an insatiable appetite to create meaningful impact at scale. The bad example was fab, but I don't want to heap scorn. You know, I, I lament their loss. The third, in terms of the, the unknown, and the, I'll tell you why I say Soylent, that's a really interesting pivot. Whether or not you agree with the founder's story, who was working on a hardware product that was cost and labor intensive, and decided when they had scarce resources to stop eating and to figure out some other way of meeting his, his uh, corporal needs, thus giving birth to Soylent. That's one version of keeping going and adding cost. Let's see what the outcome turns out to be. Um, everyone knows William Gibson's famous aphorism of the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. I certainly believe that is true. Uh, I'm deeply curious to see where we head in terms of what I call tiramisu tech, this layered approach of powerful tools coupled with expert human intelligence. So when we're able, because you know, lots of people have said, you know, that everything in, in the web, everything in mobile is, in, is already saturated. Those wars have been won and these are all sort of insignificant or inconsequential battles. The great opportunities for innovation are around nanotech, or gain, genetics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology. What would LinkedIn look like if we were being genetically matched to the things that we were predisposed to do? What would a match.com look like if our own DNA was being filtered to our other compatible DNAs? What would eBay be like? I mean, that's, even, that's not even a scenario I've thought much about, but these are the questions that I would love to wrestle with in the months and years to come. Um, curation at inception. The, the idea here is, does anyone here know Print All Over Me, which is a really amazing New York startup? Great. So why is it that we can't build original designs or our own sense of identity and intent into the, the conceptually speaking, into the DNA of the garment rather than sort of uh, advancing it or sorry, or shaping it at a later stage? You're already seeing evidence of this from Nike. Maybe LV wasn't such a good example. The other version of this was her. Her, at the, in terms of the collaboration with the opening ceremony, was early evidence of what I like to call transactional entertainment. If films and magazines are terrific at cultivating desire where none existed hitherto, why is it that we can't start to program more of these products and more of these experiences into cinema? Because film is really one of the last bastions where we're, we're in an increasingly connected but uh, dispiriting world where we permit ourselves or grant ourselves permission to feel. And I think that's where truly visceral encounters are more likely to occur. When was the last time that everyone went to a website and thought, oh, my life has now changed? That hasn't happened recently. But I would place money that you've all had a moment in a theater or at home when you've cried or you've laughed and you felt curious again or you, you came into contact with a deeper part of your soul courtesy of this powerful and convincing narrative. And I think that can only happen on film. And I think it raises, again, interesting questions about what it means for tech.
Conscientious consumption, I think this is what we're on the verge of. It took Alice Waters 40 years to be beatified as the patron saint of slow food. She started growing food in her backyard, serving it directly to Plate in Berkeley. There's no reason why we shouldn't have a similar movement in commerce in the next couple of years. I think it's already happening. Um, Call it intelligent acquisition, call it purposeful purchase, whatever you choose to call it, it's here. The reason I use the Warby Toms Casper Airbnb Square is we know what that consumer looks like. Those brands all correspond to one another. There's a whole constellation of brands and producers and uh, food types that correspond to the world of gastronomy that we don't have time to address tonight. I think it's doubtless going to have an impact on fast fashion. And I think I, uh, there was a point I was going to make about going from Keynes to Kanye, but again, mindful of time, we got to move on. Uh, this is what I truly believe the world needs more of. I, I'm not good at math, nor was I ever, but there's a specific language and a programmatic approach to problem solving courtesy of numbers that I do think more of us should force ourselves to struggle with, to come at problems octagonally and to figure out solutions that might not seem so familiar. I think there does need to be more reading. We often don't have time. Scrolling with your thumb is not tantamount to divorcing yourself of technology for a specific period of time and having an intimate encounter with text. I think the third is more noise. It's through distraction and abrasive and the things that drive us fucking bananas that you developed a bug list which could very well turn into the next major company that you individually start. Um, so it's noise and discomfort both. I think there's, there's something to be said about strategic uh, distractions. And then I just have, I'm sort of making a case for more experiments. Failing early, failing often, failing forward. I know I said not to use the word failure, but I mean, where is that evidence of trial things before blowing it up into bigger and bigger experiments. It's a hard thing to do at a big company. It's an easier thing to do at a small company, but I want to see that longer fossil record. I don't want something that the dinosaur is where we stumble across something that, you know, by dint of luck alone was existing in southern Montana. I want a long, clear record of things that didn't work until we find the one that does. The final point was really just about memories. Um, you know, even in this era of infinite connectedness, I think that there's a deeper psychic yearning to, to interact with fellow human beings. And if you think about the moments in your life that you cherish the most and that define or inform your character, the person that you are today or the person that you someday aspire to be, that is based in memory. So what can we do? It's sort of like a, a clarion call as designers, as people thinking passionately about the space to create or cultivate more meaningful memories that people can translate into real and measurable dividends in our lives. I think that's all I have. And I know I'm stumbling around, so forgive me because I'm heavily medicated and sort of in physical pain, but if you have any questions, I'd be <laughs> delighted to it? answer them. Cool. Oh, right here. I really appreciated your uh, presentation. I just want to ask you something that, you know, I'm getting back to early childhood education at my age and I'm older than you are. All the things that you were saying seem to have things to do with human potentiality education, but all the focus is always on the people who are adults and already through it. But do you think there's a responsibility of people like even, you know, an industry to, to be concerned about early childhood education, like children are our most valuable resource. And if you've seen the TED Talks like Sugata, 10, 11 year olds solving genetic engineering problems, or program based, edu project based education in Tucson, eight year olds solving problems better than major companies, that children, we, as human beings, we have this natural creative ability that is just knocked out of us in ding dong school, right. turn us into puppet Pinocchio nutcases. And I'm just wondering, do you feel like an innovative thing of dealing with the children who are coming up that have this natural human potentiality of working from that point without blanketing it down? You know, what I, any kind of feedback you have on this, I know it's a very broad question, but uh, your presentation seemed to be connected with some of these things. Um, can I propose that you email me when I can think about it, when I'm a little clearer headed? Uh, on my toes, the only answer I could produce is, is the following. One, I think we place an undue supremacy on, uh, on youth and on um, performance at an uncommonly early age, particularly in this country. There isn't much, we don't venerate uh, those older than us and with more experience. We don't have the same inbuilt or constitutional respect for the elderly that, we, that you see in most other cultures on planet Earth. 
Um, I'm deeply curious about how to bridge that, what seems to me like an ever-widening delta between the two. Uh, there are other questions about in, uh, enriching the quality of people's lives over the age of 70 that I'm equally interested in. I haven't spent much time thinking about early childhood cases for two reasons. One, I don't have kids. And two, I don't enjoy the company of children. <laughs> they drive me nuts. But that doesn't mean that that, that, that makes me an asshole. Not the, the question and an insignificant one, but I'd love to be able to think more about it when I'm clear-headed. Oh, hi. So um, I used to read Bureau of Trade, so like, congrats on, you know, being at eBay now. I mean, it like clearly made sense, but I, I did really enjoy your, your kind of like, how, how like not exactly blog, but like commerce experiment from back in the days. Um, so what exactly are you doing at eBay? Are you making some sort of like artificial intelligence powered like Bureau of Trade thing that will automatically turn all of eBay into that? Because that would actually be awesome, but like, I mean, in general, like how, how does it work? <laughs> it's a totally reasonable question. I think uh, uh, when I was brought to eBay by Devin Wenig, who was then the president and is now the CEO, his belief was, I want you to do, I want you to take that same recipe of taking a situation or a story in service of a sale and do it at scale for eBay. So the idea was, can you curate 800 million listings and make them more meaningful, more memorable, more emotional? And what I learned, mindful of the conversation we just had about government, was that uh, in 1964, Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act. How much of an impact did it make on the lives of everyday African Americans? Almost none. It wasn't until the swift subsequent passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, enforceable at the end of a bayonet, that anything started to change. And I think the same is, is often true at large companies, is that the, the visionary in charge can say one thing, but carrying out their will is profoundly more challenging. So my role has flipped. Rather than trying to curate eBay for the world, I'm now trying to curate the world for eBay. Bay. So it's about activating relationships with the emerging contemporary artists. It's about bringing in startups that we think are going to be directly applicable to our business. It's about holding our, us accountable for the things we should be doing, the things we want to be doing, the things we have to do in order to compete. And uh, sometimes acting as provocateur or coach, psychiatrist, um, I'm sort of hired to make people uncomfortable. And it's, uh, there's plenty of material evidence, because I saw some colleagues of mine in, in the crowd tonight that would can probably attest to that. But it's, I think it's from a, a place of sincere intent. I love this company. I want this to win because I believe that as people begin to make more responsible purchase decisions about the things they love and about things that are going to save us from collective ob oblivion from spending indiscriminately and on poisonous, toxic things, companies like eBay will win because we have the world's most interesting inventory. It's dust from outer space that landed on planet Earth courtesy of a comet colliding with us. It's treasures from the bottom of the ocean that you might not have even seen in a museum but are suddenly on display because someone was collecting them for generations. Or the watch that you always dreamed about because it was worn on your grandfather's wrist. You can only find those things on eBay, right? So again, simplified, it's curating the world for us and giving people permission to think about this site in a new and dramatically different way. Cool, we'll wrap up with uh, one last one. Hi, I was wondering, I, I really like your approach on, you know, the way that you look at the world. I think that's, you know, very useful from everybody in here um, that's spoken even. But at any rate, I'm wondering what, uh, if you have any examples of successful uh, designs that really take a complex kind of situation or, you know, set of, uh, you know, directions a person can go and uh, if you have you know just anything that you would you would cite as far as that has accomplished that and maybe what your process is a little bit in terms of creating that on the eBay side or anything let me do the best job I can with it. uh, it's an excellent question let me let me give a couple of examples has, has anyone seen this site called project Bly I think that was the name of it I think it was called Project Blind. So the idea was, how can I recreate the sensorial experience of being, or sacrificially speaking, in a market in Mumbai and make it shoppable for you today instantly? And they did that. It was beautiful photography and accompanying photos and short stories and then the products that you would likely find there, you know, vintage Indian movie posters and scarves and uh, teapots and things of that variety. But it raises an interesting question. Do those things matter to you if you didn't go there? Maybe. 
but I'm not convinced that they would, okay? So second example, meaning they did such a terrific job, but if you don't have some kind of a personal memory to assign or affix to it, is it still equally compelling? Don't know. Second example would be Trunk, TRNK, NYC. Those are examples only because they're primarily uh, culled from the continental United States, the lower 48 mostly. So if you're granted cart uh, what is it? a grand entree into someone's home, and you're given small portraits, like beautiful vignettes of items as they correspond to one another, and a person in their environment that they've diligently pieced together. Somehow, when I, when I, in my mind and in my heart, align that product with that person in that setting, that makes sense. And it becomes everything that you loved about perusing magazines as a kid from page to page to page with a sense of airiness and space and purpose, but recreated with the seamlessness that only digital can deliver. Because remember, what you're supposed to do online and what you're supposed to do in person are fundamentally different. They're not supposed to deliver the same kind of an experience. So Trunk NYC, I think, is another example. I'm more interested in how do we successfully marry kinetic content, meaning moving images, with static photos, with compelling stories, all in a manner that has a degree of orchestration and fluidity. I think there are interesting examples from Netta Porte and Mr. Porte of things that do and don't work. I think there are uh, a rising number of examples, even in uh, curatorial examples through Instagram, that achieve that, that manage to tell a totally compelling, even an emotional story through a fixed and static image. So the bigger question is, how do we take the things that we love elsewhere and inform the designs and what's increasingly feeling and looking like in our archaic medium, the web, that will still feed out to and create a sense of continuity through a 360 experience across mobile, in person, on web, and in the context of the rest of our lives. And I think the brands that succeed long term are those that take that systemic approach to design. Is that sufficiently specific? Okay. <laughs> All right, awesome end of Thanks the evening. Guys. Thank you so much.